good morning, good afternoon, and good night for everybody. On behalf of the Brazilian GBIF Node, I would like to thank you everyone for your presence, all project partners, speakers, and those who are watching on YouTube. My name is Clara, and I'm a data manager in the Brazilian Biodiversity Information System in Brazil. Um, so I will lead today's e event together with other project partners. So in order to not to delay any longer, I would like to invite the first speaker, Mr. Donald um, Hoburn. is a data manager director of the Australian Plant Phenomics Facility and executive secretary in International Barcode of Life Consortium. She, he's based in Canberra, Australia. So Donald was also director of the Living Atlas Australia and executive secretary of the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. Thank you so much, Donna, for being here, uh, for your interest and participation in this webinar. Thank you very much indeed, Clara. It's a great pleasure to be here today. And uh, I'm going to spend the time for my talk trying to address three areas that I hope each will have some interest uh, to the, the audience today. So first of all, OK. Uh, so. What I wanted to talk about, first of all, was uh, some general points I think are important when thinking about developing national or other biodiversity portals. And then I'll spend some time talking about uh, the work of the Barcode of Life and some of the ways in which I think it may be relevant to some of your considerations. And then spend the remainder of the time talking about the Catalogue of Life and how its taxonomic checklists are constructed, and again, about the, the relevance of this to your activity. But first of all, based on my experience with, with the Atlas of Living Australia, with GBIF, and with other biodiversity data projects, I wanted to talk about three issues that I think are important when considering the design and the implementation of biodiversity portals. And the first of these uh, is, is represented here on this slide. And that is that we're well aware that our study of biodiversity involves both geography and taxonomy, but this is also reflected as one of the challenges in structuring our portals and in every part of the, the data and the study that goes on uh, around biodiversity. There's a split between a local or national focus. Much of the activity takes place at this level. We build national species lists. We revise the, uh, the biogeography for a region. We construct portals like, like um, Sib Bayar or the Atlas of Living Australia. We think about local biodiversity as a key part of our information delivery. And yet at the same time, much information gets managed at the global scale. We build global species lists. We put together big infrastructures such as GBIF. We develop red lists at the global scale. And cutting across this, there is the division between areas where we are focused on just some species, a particular taxonomic group, and those such as in areas more of broader biogeography and ecology or conservation, where we may be trying to think about all species. And this provides a challenge for us when we're developing portals, because our experts and our data needs to be connected in all of these different directions. Uh, the same experts are likely to be working on supporting global data sets and on local and national data sets. The data that we are collecting for any particular species, the checklists we put together, are going to be of value for the biogeographers and the ecologists. And this means we've got to be thinking about connections which may not be natural to each of the data sets. And in particular, we need to be thinking about how to make it easy for our data sets and our experts to be of value in all of these areas, not requiring experts to uh, contribute repeatedly. A second 
issue which I think is important and has affected many of the activities that I've been involved in is that we have many types of information that we wish to collect and many groups of researchers, naturalists, government agencies, conservation groups and others who are working to, to organize this information. And it's very natural and quite right, therefore, at the national scale or the global scale, for all of these groups to work together to try to build an information resource. But in practice, there are imbalances in this, uh, in this structure. Very often, uh, this was certainly the case with the Atlas of Living Australia, the initial impetus for putting together a national portal and a national information system comes from the taxonomic communities and their uh, interest in seeing this information well managed. But much of the funding tends to come in support of environmental management, conservation, uh, and resource management activities, which are really focused more on the biogeographic side. And so there's something of a tension that the money is often directed towards providing the services that are needed for conservation and government, but the quality of everything depends on keeping the taxonomic communities and the other parties that understand the species participating and benefiting and contributing their knowledge. And so we have to find ways to enable everyone not only to work together and to contribute, but to see value in this shared activity. And the third area I just wanted briefly to touch on is around this comp complication of trying to build national portals and global information systems. This applies whether we're thinking of something like the Catalogue of Life or GBIF, uh, or GenBank, any system where we may be collecting and organizing information at the national scale, but want to be able to make it accessible at the global scale. So here in this, in this diagram, I'm trying to represent the idea that in three countries, there may be different databases, perhaps natural history collections, ecological data sets, uh, or other resources, which are shared by the researchers or other uh, data holders in those countries. In two of these countries, they share the data through a national portal. Uh, in the, the other country, there is as, at present no national portal. And yet the information that these databases contain may include details and records that apply to all three of these countries. And so very often we focus on activities like GBIF, which help to bring the data together at a global scale, helping everyone to work together to produce a bigger picture. But this can still leave complications for the users with particular questions. If a user is interested primarily in the resources and the biodiversity of country A, they may choose quite rightly to make use of a national portal that has high quality national species lists and uh, information on protected areas in the country, for example. But unless something special happens, they won't be seeing all of the data that may be visible at the global scale or to others such as the user interested here in country C that choose to go to a global portal. And so we have a challenge of thinking about how to connect information in both directions. And so what I wanted to, to point out here is that very often, where possible, it may be more logical for us to be thinking about working together to build a single harvested view of the data like the GBIF data index and thinking about how we can enrich its services to help us to deliver really high quality national portals. Uh, and I think this is, in my mind, the big excitement of the Living Atlases project, that it provides a framework where we can move away from some of this very complicated all directions sharing of data towards a more integrated uh, and simple streamlined approach. So I just wanted to draw three very general principles out of those comments. First of all, there is value for us in working together at the global scale. Even if our focus is on building a national resource, 
it makes sense for us to work together around tools that we can all share and around data sets into which we all contribute. If nothing else, this is a way for us to make the best use of the experts we have to avoid taxonomists and others having to contribute effectively the same information to different data sets. Secondly, uh, and I, I can't emphasize this enough, even if the primary reason why we get funding for our activities is to build portals that can support conservation, land use planning and government activities, it's really important that we find ways to give value to the taxonomists and other experts that are participating in our activities. They are the ultimate source of the quality and the assurance that uh, the data that everyone else wishes to use is actually of the highest possible quality. And so we need to think about ways in which we can give value back to those researchers. And finally here, um, I would suggest again that there is real value in thinking about an architecture to our activities that you makes use of global aggregations as the place where we organize our data. So GBIF, Catalog of Life, uh, the World Register of Marine Species, World Flora Online, activities like this are an opportunity not only for us to, uh, to share our work together at the end of the day, but perhaps also a way that we can build a common information pool from which we then make use of the data. I'm going to spend the rest of this talk just picking up on some of the features and functions and the data in two of the networks where I'm now working uh, at the moment. The first of these is the International Barcode of Life. And uh, in some ways, this is less relevant to the subject of this, uh, of this webinar than the other part I'll be talking about. But still, I think there's some points I'd like to make. IBOL, the International Barcode of Life, is currently working on a seven-year program that it's calling Bioscan. The goal of this is to move from the past uh, model for its activities, which has really been on a uh, relatively slow building of the reference library for uh, DNA reference library for identifying species towards a world in which we have interconnected databases and tools for continuous observation of species through DNA. And that means a large scaling up of the number of specimens that need to be sequenced so that we have the reference sequences, but also starting to think about how we use uh, eDNA and bulk samples and the co-occurrence of species as one of our tools for surveying and monitoring biodiversity. And I'm excited by this in large part because this is an opportunity for us as biodiversity researchers to move away from a world where we know a great deal about birds and vascular plants and a few other groups towards one where we can genuinely survey much more of the real diversity of life on Earth in an effective and consistent way. Barcode of Life is focused really on two channels. One is taking individual specimens with identifications and getting the sequences from them that we can use as references. And then secondly, focused on the, as cheap as possible, uh, sequencing of large numbers of specimens so that we get bulk evidence of species occurrence. The current program is particularly focused on insect populations and uh, in several of, um, of the, the, the countries in your region, uh, there are now active programs that are contributing to Bioscan through malaise trapping of insects uh, and submitting samples uh, for, uh, for this sequencing program. One of the results of this is that we increasingly build up clusters of data, uh, sequence data associated with named specimens that allow us then to, uh, 
to use this as a tool for future taxonomy, uh, as well as for this uh, field identification of, of specimens from sequences. And as I hope many of you are aware, uh, within GBIF, there is increasingly a focus on plugging these molecular identifiers, the molecular identifiers that indicate the, the clusters of, species, of specimens that seem to form a, a genetically uh, connected unit as part of the overall taxonomic hierarchy. And this, I think, is a key direction we need to address together. Uh, we're not saying that all of these clusters uh, that are indicated by the red box on this slide are genuinely uh, separate species, but they are recognizable in the field. And we can, over time, increasingly place names on these and work out how they cluster alongside all of the named species and other taxa in our lists. So I think that uh, just as GBEF has already been making progress in this direction and starting to link these kinds of identifiers to the framework of the taxonomic backbone, uh, which is built upon Catalog of Life and other sources, that this is an opportunity for us as biodiversity informaticians to play a key part in bridging between genomic uh, biodiversity science uh, and more classical field ecology, collections-based research, uh, et cetera. Uh, I'll just, this is, this is a bit of, um, of self-interest here. This is uh, some views from a site that I've created that's just taking the barcode of life data and making it more useful for some of the purposes that I have here in Australia. Uh, and, and I think it's, uh, if nothing else, a pointer to the kind of things that we can be doing as we join together more molecular data and more data organized using molecular uh, clustering as part of our taxonomic framework. In this particular case, I'm showing all of the records in the barcode of life that have been identified, uh, sorry, that, um, that have been identified under the species name Disbartus stenodesma. Uh, and as you can see, there are two colored areas on this view. This shows that uh, from, a, from the standpoint of the clustering of the DNA in these specimens, uh, there are two separate clusters. Uh, and this is a useful review tool for looking at some of these specimens and understanding the actual levels of diversity. Uh, and it's possible for us to flip this the other way. This is looking at a single cluster and realizing that within the Barcode of Life database, there are four different identifications that have been associated with this cluster. Uh, it seems very likely that the identification Disbatus stenodesma is correct, but there are several specimens that have been identified either just as Lepidoptera uh, or to the genus or to an unidentified uh, name within the genus. And I think that uh, it's, it's valuable in thinking about national portals and how we're building them to be planning early how we're going to make use of data, including imagery associated with sequences where we may not have uh, standard uh, Linnaean names yet uh, for some of those organisms. I wanted to, uh, to focus most here though, because I think it's, it's the most relevant to the, the topic as I was assigned, that I was assigned on the catalog of life. And I, I hope that most of you are aware in some sense at least of uh, the catalog of life and uh, its activities. Uh, this is a view of the current version of the catalog of life portal that was uh, released, uh, I think around the turn of this year, maybe, maybe late last year. Um, and for those of you who don't know, Catalog of Life is a, an international project uh, involving Species 2000 and the Integrated Taxonomic Information System. Uh, and now with a partnership from GBIF uh, in providing some of the infrastructure to build a, the best possible uh, comprehensive species list of all life on Earth. Uh, and doing so, by bringing together, I've lost a slide. Um, uh, bringing together 
uh, the uh, checklists that have been developed for different taxonomic groups by uh, authoritative taxonomists working on those groups. So uh, you'll be hearing a little bit later uh, about the activities of worms, particularly with marine, but also with other taxonomic groups. Many of the worms databases feed uh, also into the catalog of life. But additionally, uh, we have other sectors that have been developed for different uh, phyla or classes of organisms, uh, and that the catalog of life uh, updates regularly as part of a combined hierarchy. Uh, as I mentioned, for many years, uh, the catalog of life has been one of the major components that feeds into the construction of the GBIF taxonomic backbone. And the function of the current joint development activities between the catalog of life and GBIF is to close the gap between these two efforts so that together we are constructing a list that is as comprehensive as, as is required for GBIF and others to index data, and where at the same time, all of the portions which are well curated taxonomy are clearly marked so that users can see uh, the most comprehensive list possible without uh, any confusion as to uh, which parts have genuinely been reviewed. The way that the, the catalog of life is constructed is, uh, it's a little complicated, this diagram, but I'll step you through it with a series of, of red boxes. So on the left-hand side, we're indicating that taxonomists uh, develop lists of the species for a particular taxonomic group. Uh, they do this in many different tools. Um, uh, Lane will, well, I expect, to talk about the AFIA tool, uh, there's, there's others such as Taxon Works. Uh, historically, many of these databases have been developed in specialized uh, systems that one or two people have written for their own use. It means that there are many different formats uh, that a species checklist may appear in. Uh, some of them are built using Darwin Core Archives. Catalog of Life is increasingly using COLDP, the Catalog of Life data package but it's possible even to share data in a, in a very flat CSV spreadsheet or, or as uh, what's here called a text tree, which is just an indented text document. Uh, multiple structures uh, are interpreted. And uh, and as these, um, these authors uh, maintain these data, whether they're in, web accessible uh, databases or just sitting on their own computers, uh, they can publish them to the web uh, and more specifically to the Catalog of Life checklist bank, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. Uh, this is uh, a relatively recent product of the Catalog of Life, but it is a tool that makes it possible uh, to publish any checklist data set uh, for web access uh, and with uh, a number of useful tools uh, that uh, will make it easier for the, uh, anyone to make use of that data set, to reference it, uh, or to plug it into uh, another website. So uh, I would suggest that for many of the purposes that a national portal has, uh, the Catalog of Life Checklist Bank may be a useful platform uh, for sharing species lists and for putting them together and for serving them for use uh, in the national infrastructure. Uh, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute, but if as any of you go forward, uh, you wish to explore this possibility, please do contact me and I'll uh, try to work out uh, with you how to ensure that the catalog of life function is, is able to meet your needs. The result of putting all of these uh, data sets into Checklist Bank is that all of them are turned into a standardized uh, interpreted form that includes all of the names, all of the synonyms, uh, and other information out of those data sets in a form that can then be used by Catalog of Life to construct uh, the, the Catalog of Life checklist itself, the, the global species view uh, that uh, gets updated uh, roughly every month. 
Uh, these tools, the tools in the workbench, which we use for building the, the catalog, uh, are ones where we're hoping too that they will be suitable for others to build their own uh, species lists out of different components in just the same way that the catalog of life does. So we're treating Checklist Bank as a kind of uh, toolbox of species lists that could be composed in different ways to build lists for many different purposes. And then, of course, the goal is to make sure that these lists are accessible and usable uh, for human users and uh, different machine applications in, in different ways. Checklist Bank, um, it, it looks like this. Uh, it's, it's hosted uh, by GBIF and it's jointly developed by GBIF and Catalog of Life. Uh, it provides a set of tools and a search interface for looking for uh, data sets that have been published. As you can see at the moment, uh, at least when this shot was taken, uh, there were 317 uh, data sets already imported into Checklist Bank. Uh, for each of them, uh, they'd have, they have all of the, the metadata you would expect, uh, tools for browsing the hierarchy and for viewing uh, details for any species uh, in any of these checklists. The part that um, certainly interests me going forward is this part, that uh, it is possible to use this infrastructure to establish projects such as uh, this one I'm working on at the moment for constructing uh, new checklists out of different components. Uh, in this case, I'm just putting together some uh, different super families of the Lepidoptera to, uh, to build an updated version of the butterfly and moth species list. Uh, it's relatively simple here. I'm taking uh, existing data sets at the super family level and then just stitching them together. But uh, there's a lot more flexibility too to get reporting on uh, collisions and differences and potential problems with any of the data so that this is uh, a tool set uh, for editing and curating uh, the species lists in order to make them into the kind of uh, data resources that can be used uh, for a national portal, for the catalog of life, uh, or in principle for any other uh, compound species list that we may need to build. And uh, this is is my own website uh, where I provide a public view of the catalog of the world plume moths. Uh, and the reason I'm showing this here is simply that uh, the view you see here of a taxonomic hierarchy and the search box, uh, I'm not hosting these data locally. I'm just using the application programming interface of the catalog of life checklist bank uh, to provide the support for this so that I don't have to. Uh, and again, I think this means that for many purposes, either with national portals or with uh, other websites that we may wish to develop, uh, there's, there's potentially real value in simply using uh, the Catalog of Life Checklist Bank as one of the tools uh, for exposing species lists. The, the last aspect of Catalog of Life I just really quickly wanted to talk about is around uh, the need for us to evolve. Uh, Catalog of Life started at a time when there were few species lists on the web, and uh, we worked with uh, those who were ready to share their data uh, to build the fullest list we could. Uh, we're now in a world where for some taxa, uh, there are multiple species lists on the web, uh, and therefore, we need to be doing a better job of uh, transparently uh, working with different groups to get the best possible list and to uh, help different groups to work together so that we have a clear and well justified reason for the lists we show. Uh, additionally, we need to be thinking in more innovative ways about how we can support the work of taxonomists who may not have a view of the entire global fauna, uh, but uh, can contribute to uh, building together uh, a, an up-to-date and current list for some of the big groups that are otherwise not covered. So we've been spending quite a bit of time looking at 
uh, principles for the future directions of, of Catalogue of Life uh, and better criteria for more, more fair and open and transparent uh, management of the components that make the checklist. Uh, and this really brings me back to the point that I started with, which is that uh, we need to get to the point where Catalogue of Life, um, as with all of the other data portals that I've been talking about, isn't just a, uh, a way that the taxonomic community can share its resources for others, but we need to get closer to the point where it provides a useful function by helping taxonomists and others to manage the data that they use in their day-to-day -day activities. We're still some way away from that. Um, certain parts of the catalog of life certainly do have that characteristic, but uh, if we're going to have high quality data, if we're going to have well-organized taxonomic frameworks for our portals, then we need to make sure that the taxonomists themselves are well supported and uh, value uh, making use of the same resources. Finally, uh, just to summarize, uh, some of the ways in which I think uh, eyeball, uh, barcode of life and catalog of life may be of use in the context of national portals. First of all, uh, for the barcode of life, um, con contributing specimen and sequence data to expand uh, the reference library in, in bold, the barcode of life data systems, is a path to ensuring that future metagenomics activities in all our countries has the best possible taxonomic foundation. And that when we get identifications from DNA, they are as likely as possible to be accurate. Uh, we have the opportunity now, and GBIF has been leading, some, leading the way with this, to start integrating molecular identifications into the kind of taxonomic frameworks that we're using in our portals. Uh, and we should be looking at ways in which this integration isn't just uh, a, uh, an addition to the good work that, uh, that taxonomic experts give to us, but potentially how we can be delivering the interfaces that make it easy to flip between molecular perspectives and uh, Linnaean classifications uh, and to explore the implications of one on the other. And finally, uh, for the catalog of life, I would uh, encourage any who are trying to organize either whole national species lists or portions of those lists to consider uh, making use of catalog of life checklist bank as part of the the infrastructure for doing so. Certainly, we'd be very keen to work with you. There's a, a lot of good tooling and a lot that's very simple. It's not yet a place where you could uh, easily edit and develop a checklist, but as a platform for sharing them and for making them useful for combination in different ways, uh, that's exactly what it's been um, intended for. Uh, and we're very keen to work with taxonomists uh, in all regions to expand the, uh, the expert base that is contributing to the different sections of Catalogue of Life. Uh, so uh, thank you all very much for this opportunity to talk. I'm very happy if there's any time uh, to address any questions I can, otherwise uh, happy to do so uh, by email uh, or any other channel that you can access me. Thank you very much indeed. Um, thank you so much, Donald, for the whole presentation. Excellent. It's impressive what advances and techniques, technologies to organize and integrate all that. Um, I'm trying to some... unshare, but I can. Oh, maybe I can do it that way. Sorry, I'm trying to unshare my screen. I can't work out how to do it. I'm, I've lost one of the. Uh, right. <laughs> um, maybe we can fix this. Anyone has any question or comment, Donald? Uh, we have 10, 15 minutes to talk about. Okay, Camila. Hi, Donald, thank you. It, it was very interesting to, to see uh, how everything has evolved. I, I'm wondering with this new system, if someone wants to uh, add a new uh, national taxonomic checklist, uh, how, how long does it take? Uh, with this new system, uh, have full integration. Uh, so, I'll, I'll I'll make make a couple of things clear. No, number one, uh, if 
it, it obviously depends on the format in which the, the species list already exists. But uh, putting it into Checklist Bank is generally fairly easy because there's a lot of different import paths. Uh, the, at the moment, Catalogue of Life is still trying to move its way towards making better use than it has in the past of national species lists as part of building the global list. But this has always been a big challenge because putting together different regional um, lists that cover the same family or, or order is actually very hard because taxonomists in different regions have, have different, um, uh, different approaches in, in many cases. And so putting it together can be very difficult. But what I was trying to emphasize here is that if you have components of national lists that you wish to put together, uh, for example, you might decide that uh, you, you, you wanted to make use of big sections of worms and catalog of life for most of the taxonomic framework of your, um, your portal, but that you wanted to override some section, the, the vascular plants or the mosses, uh, because you had a better national list that was more applicable, then I think uh, it could be valuable for us to be look, working with you on how you might use Checklist Bank uh, as one of the ways to build a, a new synthetic list that included uh, both those parts. Thank you, Donald. Um, thank you, Donald and Camila. We have another question from, from Eduardo Dalcin from Brazil. Um, say hi, Donald, good to see you, healthy and safe. I have a question related with taxonomic communities of yeah. Catalog of Life, how they are identified and select trust as trusted taxonomy authorities. Okay, uh, I think that's that's a, a very fair question and, and the one that um, I was trying to address at the end. In the, in the past, uh, there have been few cases where Catalog of Life has had multiple uh, different taxonomic authorities to choose between. Uh, and I would say that perhaps Catalog of Life has been too conservative sometimes in sticking with a version of a list because it's the one we've used in the past. And uh, we are working now to revisit our processes to become more transparent for this reason. Uh, you may have, the, the paper that I um, I showed in one of the the final slides uh, on principles for governing of taxonomic lists uh, is something that we're taking very seriously. This came out of an IUBS working group activity, uh, but it aligns well with our thinking that uh, we need to be able to describe very clearly exactly why a particular section is in the catalog of life, or if we have to, um, if, or, I suppose, to show the expert chain that lies behind these things. Catalogue of Life has always done that by listing all of the data sets that contribute, but we'd also like to be uh, ex expressing more clearly why one authority as opposed to another is included. And I would like us uh, to be moving now towards a process a little like um, some of the processes from uh, zoological nomenclature where if there is an issue of selection between two alternatives, that we, we have something of an open and public discussion or review of some of these things. And I realize that that can be contentious and difficult, but I do think that it's important for us to have a resource that we can all trust as being the best one that we can, uh, we can put together. Uh, so my answer would be, we're not perfect on that yet, but. Uh, increasing the transparency and the clarity around those reasons is really important to us. Thank you. Thanks so much, Donna.